Welcome to this um, fascinating event. We will talk about past, however difficult, but looking at the future. We start today with the lecture of Professor Kubik, but may I ask uh, Professor Macmillan, the host of this college, our warden, to say a few words to welcome us. Welcome to St. Anthony's College, of which I am very lucky to be the warden. One of the greatest pleasures of my job is to come to the conferences and the lectures which take place in this college. This week has been a particularly interesting one, but every week is a particularly interesting one. But yesterday we had um, the Nobel Prize winner for literature speaking, Madam Alexievich. Um, today we have this, and tomorrow we have this wonderful conference. And then on Thursday, we have Noam Chomsky coming to speak about the Middle East. I can't remember what's happening on Friday, but I think it's someone, something, someone equally interesting on an equally interesting subject. But one of the great strengths, I think, of the college is that we have people with strong regional knowledge, deep expertise in particular areas, in the history, the sociology, the politics, the culture of these areas. And we have such expertise among our fellows, but we also have wonderful visitors who come and contribute to the intellectual life of this college. And I'm particularly grateful that we have with us Karolina Vigura as the visiting Polish fellow, and who has so generously undertaken to organize this conference. And as you can see, it's an extraordinary conference indeed. It's a conference which looks at a subject, I think, which interests us all in various ways from whatever parts of the world we come, dealing with a difficult past and looking into the future, Poland's transitional justice in a comparative prospect, perspective. And looking at the past seems to be, Poland has a difficult past, but it's looking at that past seems to be particularly difficult at the moment. And the people who are here today, I think, will help us to understand that. I don't want to say that Poland's past is more difficult than that of any other country, but it certainly does present particular problems. And I welcome this conference, which will, I think, help us to understand what those problems are. And I hope that you will give us at least some hope for the future uh, in Poland, and if not hope for the future of dealing with the past, at least an understanding of the debates that are going on within Poland at the moment, and I think probably will be going on. But I'd like to congratulate you, Karolina, if I may, on organizing this conference. Congratulate and thank all of you as well who have come to take part. And I look forward, as I know we all do, to a very interesting conference, which will, of course, be about Poland, but will be about much wider issues. And I think will help us all to think about different regions of the world as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. You already mentioned the spiritus moven of this conference, key organizers, Carolina Vigura, who, who is now a fellow of this program of Mother Poland at the college, but comes from Warsaw, where she, she teaches at the University of Warsaw, and she also works at Cultura Liberalna Weekly. Carolina, uh, please, while you are walking to the podium, I just mentioned one of the books you publish related to this topic, Guild of Nations, Forgiveness as a Political Strategy. And now we are going a step further. Tell us all about this. Uh, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here tonight. And it is an honor, it has been an honor to organize uh, this conference here. When we first thought about the idea of the, of the conference, when we were speaking about the conference for the first time, we didn't know that the things would turn this way. We did not have any idea about the result of October elections uh, in Warsaw. And um, so we didn't know that this particular subject would, would be of such an importance today. Um, let me please tell you a couple uh, of questions, a couple of subjects that will be most important during today's um, session and also during the whole 
day tomorrow. In 1933, a Turkish poet, Nazim Hakmet, has written words, he was jailed at that time, that in the 20th century, grief will last at most a year. History proved him wrong, and so in the 20th century, and especially a few decades after 1945, memory loomed large, mostly in European, but not only in European identity. We were not only to learn about the past, we were to repent, to walk through the past, to understand the past, and to learn from it. Poland poses itself as a difficult and challenging case of this process. I believe that Polish model, if it exists, is one of the most interesting ones. We in Poland uh, are very happy about thinking ours, about ourselves as about heroes and victims. But from the 90s, we have also been learning that these are not two the only two roles that we were playing in history, but to two roles of victims and heroes, we should rather also add the roles of perpetrators and of bystanders, at least these two roles. Now, what came as a surprise to many, and to many as a shock in the 90s and 2000s in Poland, is that these roles were present not only in one society, but also within one biography, very often. But also from the 90s, politicians and political parties started to take hostage of, 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 um, of memory and of history. And so today we stand and we observe a, a landscape which is more and more fractured within every year. And I think Jan Kubik will be speaking today exactly about this process. So when we talk about forgiveness, surely no forgiveness has occurred in this land. Comparative perspective uh, means that during today and during also tomorrow's session we'll be asking questions comparing Polish case to other cases like for example Eastern European countries but also some countries from the Western Europe and I would just like to give you a couple of questions that will be perhaps helpful or perhaps will serve as an inspiration whilst taking part in our discussions. So there are some simple questions, like for example, what are the similarities and what are the differences between various models, Polish model, German model, Baltic model, etc., etc. What does it mean that a transitional justice has been successful? What does it mean that it has been productive? Productive in what way? What were the biggest influences on the Polish model? Was it German or was it perhaps the Messianic Russian one? Now, even more important, perhaps, and more difficult questions. Among the four roles I have mentioned, perpetrators, bystanders, heroes and victims, is there any equilibrium here? How can we measure evil? Because, of course, talking about memory is also talking about human nature and evil. These are, in my opinion, the most important subjects. If Jedwabne is the Polish historical stride, what does it mean? that the current Polish authorities distance themselves from a Jedwabne discussion. What does it actually mean? Even more important and difficult questions. Germany is usually thought to be the country that has apologized to everybody, or nearly to everybody, although it hasn't, and also uh, it has let many countries waiting for their apologies. Whilst Poland has apologized numerously, but it is often said that Poland has not apologized for some of the Polish people wrong deeds. So the question is, what exactly did we learn from the German model, and what exactly didn't we learn from the German, German model? Even further, who makes comparisons and why? What is the political and institutional sense of making comparisons? And mostly, and the biggest question, what does it actually mean to deal with a difficult past? What do we want, what do we expect on the other side? If this is a process, if this is a bridge, then what is on the other side of the bridge? 
and what comes after. I hope that we will have many productive discussions. I would just like to add a few thank you remarks to people that have been so helpful for me during the past months, ask, uh, answering all my questions and uh, helping with me with every doubt. Uh, may I just mention Timothy Gartenash, Paul Betts, Alexander Smolar and Jan Zielonka that have helped me tremendously. And also I would like to to, to thank three persons that were helping me as administrators and as cooperators of this conference, and this conference would never take place without them. These are Agnieszka Gurbin, Karolina Norkiewicz, and Joanna Szulta. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Karolina, for these enlightening and kind words. We are not just in this room, we are online too, and those who follow these sessions online will be able to join our discussion later on. I will say a few words about this. But now we move to the main event, our keynote lecture of distinguished professor and a good friend who came from Poland, born close by place I was born myself, but then migrated through countries and disciplines. He studied politics, philosophy, sociology, anthropology. He worked at the universities of, of Krakow, Columbia. He studied and worked at the University of Krakow, Columbia, Rutgers, and now University College London, where he is also director of the School of Slavonic Studies. He's an author of numerous important publications on very different topics. So different, not just about communism, and post communist but also uh, protest, culture, social movements, and methods, interpretative and uh, ethnographical, right? So uh, he is uh, our Polish equivalent of Renaissance man, and he will today um, give an introductory uh, uh, lecture, which, which will hopefully inspire the discussions tomorrow in in, in more uh, uh, direct way. Jan Kubis, you have the floor. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Magnilan. Thank you, Katarzyna. Uh, Katarzyna gave you a long list of people whom I am supposed to thank, so thank you all the people who are on Katarzyna's list. Thank you very much. I am really honored and I am uh, very happy to be here. And tomorrow's discussions certainly will push my thinking further. Um, so let me begin, it is about 50 minutes, uh, hopefully I'll be able to do that in the planned time. <coughs> uh, as an anthropologist I always like to remind people that uh, people think about the significance of narratives and stories in every known culture. Uh, uh, closer to our uh, history and situation, uh, Stalin said famous words in 1932 that uh, production of um, tanks was less important than the production of souls. And in a way, those who are working on the manipulation or the production of various cultural narratives, including those about the past, are trying to engineer our souls. So what is this, this talk about? Um, uh, why is it all important? I will tell you this rather quickly. The main um, sort of center of, of this talk is the difference, differences and similarity, actually, between historical policy as a specific form of political activity, not only political, but I will emphasize this dimension, and politics of uh, history, another form of, of, of activity. I will, in a, a moment, uh, sort them out. So I will present two models of, of those two domains of human activity, two spheres. 
then I will look at the three areas where it is worthwhile, I believe, to compare them. Resilience of cultural codes using the construction of collective memory, uh, increasing significance of scale, this will be about transnationalization, nas national memories and subnational scales of memory, and then perhaps the most important thing that came to me while I was working on this topic, the difference between paying attention primarily to the political regime versus paying attention to the state and the strength of the state. And then I will uh, summarize uh, everything in a hopefully useful table. So what is, why is it all so important? Uh, well, many of us working on those things uh, are, of course, aware of those four dimensions of human activity, politics, social and cultural um, uh, things, construction of collective identity, struggle for legitimacy of power, consideration of transitional justice, and post-conflict reconciliation. Those are the four areas which are at the center of not only social science, but also in the center of a lot of activity in politics, but also in culture. When you think about um, the problem that was already mentioned and which will be central to um, discuss our discussions as I understand them tomorrow is what happens when you are trying to think about transitional justice and there is no accepted narrative of the past. And the project I will briefly describe for you in a moment was initiated as the project about the relationship between the politics of memory, the politics of collective memory and the transitional justice, but the first part of it proved to be so complex that we sort of did only this, and now I'm beginning to think about the, the bridge between those two things. Uh, the question, in another way, can be asked, which version is, should be taken as the foundation of the search for justice? Which version of the past? This is the most important question, it seems. So, what is the nation? We, this is the motto of, of our book from um, Leszek Kowakowski. Uh, it is worth reading one more time. It is a collective memory. It is collective memory, which is one way or another, which one way or another extends to all of us, through school, but also through a variety of common traditions, monuments, songs, verses, music, literature, that all makes us a single nation. Memory is everything thanks to which we live as a distinct whole. And here's the second part of this poem. That is the reason why ideological conflicts over, often play out through the manipulation of memory. Each nation, every European nation, has its history, in its history various shameful episodes. We try in some way to minimize these episodes, even forget about them by means of various forms of manipulation. And this was the, the guiding thought for, for, for the whole project, which, which in a moment I will um, outline for you. But first, historical policy or historical politics. Uh, politica historiczna in Polish. Uh, something that is not the domain of scholarly activity, but some scholars, actually quite a few, uh, participate in. What is it? I mean, in, in one sentence, I, I spent the last few weeks reading through a lot of uh, discussions, particularly Polish discussions. But in a nutshell, it is a deliberate policy by the state, the government, to shape the society's vision of the past, thus to shape a collective memory. I will give you just one quote from uh, Jarosław Kaczyński. Poland and Poles are attacked, are offended offended sometimes in an extraordinary manner, both outside and inside. And this needs to be blocked. This needs to be resolutely resisted. We need to have a relevant cultural policy, educational, historical policy. There is a need to engage in such endeavors that can be effective on the global scale, because this attack against Poland, against the Poles, is global in scale. This was said in uh, October uh, 2015. I think this is the most powerful expression of this, you, know, you could say, 
paranoid strain, but it is uh, a justification for uh, engaging and engaging considerable resources in uh, designing political historic historical policy. There are strong and weak programs of historical policy. Uh, as you will see, the strong, weak opposition will be important for me later. Uh, I found two works that are very useful in terms of ordering information about uh, what's going on. Two interesting typologies, one from Alexander Smoller, who is here. Uh, Piotr Wiesek developed a, a, a very nice, very nice simple typology and description of strong and weak programs. Alexander Smoller talked about four various types of historical policy. They nicely fit into strong and weak version. Among the strong versions, you have politics of conquest and politics of cold war. Among the weak versions, you have politics of permanent differentiation and peaceful coexistence. And finally, politics of lim limited democratic consensus. Even the last two, the weak version, there's still a question mark over it, whether the state should be in or the government should be engaging, even in this form of, of, of um, public activity. Uh, this is uh, important to, to keep in mind. <clears throat> Finally, what I'm studying, what we've been studying in our work, are words, and words in scholarly discourses, first of all, but also words in public performances and rituals. When, when the word travels from the academia to the public space, uh, it is performed for all kinds of reasons and purposes that have nothing to do with academic activity, with scholarly activity. Uh, they become weapons in a political uh, struggle. So in a way, the, the two types of, of public figures we are looking at, or I'm looking at in this comparison, is scholars versus activists. Okay, now to quickly um, to, to our book. Um, it's been a while, it's been published two years ago, so I've talked about it in many different places. I don't want to talk about it too much. Um, but it was a study designed as a strictly comparative work on the way the uh, 20th anniversary of the fall of communism was celebrated in um, 17 countries. We, we wanted to understand um, how far can one employ comparative method to something that is often, usually, studied through the method of single case studies? So, wh why, how did it start? Well, it started at, the, at some point at some conference where we, um, were just after the 20th anniversary, uh, 2009, so the conference was perhaps in 2010, and we were talking about uh, Poland. Now, what happened in 2009 in Poland, if, if you recall, and those many of you I'm pretty sure can, was a complete cacophony of events. I, I've written quite, quite, a, quite a bit about the wasted symbolic capital of solidarity. I mean, Poland has produced a few products that it certainly can be extremely proud of and can export with tremendously positive effects for itself. Um, and one of them is solidarity. And solidarity needs to be sold to the world in a coherent manner, otherwise, like any other product, it seems. Well, what, what you got in 2009 was this very complex set of events. Each of those pictures is taken in a different moment of early 2009. Uh, Valenza is in a different place, Mazowiecki is in a different place, President Lech Kaczynski then is in a different place. They perform different rituals of memory if you will. Um, so in the chapter, we discovered five different interpretations of the round tra table. But basically, there is a dominant polarization there between the vision of the round table as a tremendous achievement and the round table as a form of manipulated treason, almost. Uh, and there were, uh, in June, the, the round table was uh, earlier, ended earlier, in, in uh, that year, that spring. In June, during the, the celebration of the elections of June 6, 89, so in June 2009, there were five separate celebrations. So you have five, at least, five separate narratives. You have five different celebrations. 
what, what is the key there uh, it, it is something that we can describe if you take a step back the cultural and political polarization among the post anti communist elites. The key polarization emerges, that emerges is not within, between the solidarity side and the communist or ex communist side, but within the elites, not only elites that have emerged or emerged from solidarity. What we also observe is the emergence of an aggressive, uh, what we call a mnemonic warrior or memory warrior. Then, there was the question, what is it typical, right? What can we do with this, uh, how to interpret it? And I very strongly always believe that the only way to produce interesting, useful interpretations is through comparison. So we invited a group of, um, um, a lot of, um, uh, a large group of, of, of scholars, experts on those countries. We proposed to them um, the same um, analytical scheme, the same language. As you know, it is not an easy thing to ask people in a collective volume to, to follow the, the, the language of, of the editors, but in this case it worked, it was extremely rewarding, and it allowed us to produce comparisons um, that, I, I, as you will see, uh, I think tell us something new. <clears throat> the conceptual apparatus was, was relatively simple. We described or created typology of mnemonic actors uh, first, and then we created a typology of memory regimes that emerges as a result of various of, um, interactions of those actors. In a very simplistic manner, there are four types of, of actors, mnemonic warriors, mnemonic pluralists, abdicators, and perspectives. Warriors are those who say, I have a vision of the past, and it is the only true and valid version, and just get out of here. I don't want to talk to you, there's not much to talk about. That's an extreme version of the world. <coughs> the pluralist says, I have my version of the past, I have my vision of the past, but you have your own. Let's sit down and let's try to figure out if there is something we can agree upon. Some, the, the search for this something we call the search for, for mnemonic fundamentals. It happens, it doesn't happen very often, but it happens. <coughs> Abnegators are those who say, at least in the game of memory over this specific event, I am not, I am not participating. I am um, not going there. So you can abnegate on one issue and you can become a warrior on another issue. You strategize. <coughs> but the many perspectives are those who think about the future rather than the past. The communists were typical mnemonic perspectives, right? Legitimation of the system was always in the future. The paradise to come. Not it was, that was just justification, not something from the past. <clears throat> um, if you then take, in a very, again, simple model, the interactions of those four types of actors, you get, if you have a warrior, you almost always, if not always, get a fractured memory regime. Uh, why? Because the warriors impose the term of discussion of the others. You cannot, if they are sufficiently prominent in the public sphere, you cannot ignore them. You, here you are, and they say, well, your version or vision of the past is uh, wrong, invalid. You get a pillarized memory regime. This is the term used often in, in comparative politics, where you do not have a warrior, and you have at least one pluralist. And then you have a unified memory regime, where nobody debates anymore about what is, how to interpret the past. This happens rarely, but it happens. It can be created top-down by, say, the communist regimes using preventive censorship work, clearly attempting to uh, create uh, something like that. It can emerge spontaneously bottom-up, um, up, but that is an extremely complicated process. Every body needs to be committed to some basic rules of the game and not to transgress those rules. <coughs> I have no time to take you through all the cases and, and uh, even several of them. I will just give you to give, uh, just one, and very briefly, to give you the sense of the range of uh, what was happening in 2009 during the celebrations of the uh, 20th anniversary of the fall of communism. So, in the Czech Republic, this was Basarsky Amnesty during the major uh, celebration. Uh, 
what is going on there. Uh, the government basically abnegated. So our kind of theoretical type uh, is confirmed empirically. Václav Klaus was not terribly interested in celebrating something that was created by Václav Havel. Many of you know, know exactly, or all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. In the meantime, he managed to offend the, the Czech people, telling them that they are like sheep. They are always looking for the pastures that are greener somewhere else. The students who organized those events were particularly offended, and they came to the Václavský namesty as sheep. Uh, there were other uh, quite um, uh, impressive uh, pictures coming from those celebrations, but the most important thing was that it was organized by civil society, not the state. It is the only country in our sample, and it was organized by students. And it, not only in Prague, very impressive celebrations took place, for example, in, in Brno, <coughs> where Havel himself went and, and delivered a very interesting speech on the, the spirit of, of the Velvet Revolution and uh, the, the spirit actually of 1968, which was still kind of an important guiding set, provided the guiding set of principles. Those students often wanted to recover that spirit. They were also very critical of the, uh, what happened in the country over the last, uh, during those 20 years, since 89. Um, so the so social criticism was mixed with a specific kind of manner of celebrating. <clears throat> so there's an intriguing contrast. You get Czech carnival, a very carnivalesque atmosphere, versus Polish and Hungarian, I, the Hungarian case is very interesting, I will get to that in a, mo a little bit in a moment, versus Polish Hunga and Hungarian solemn mnemonic wars. It really felt differently. It, it was different cultural tone. It was a different type of culture within which all of this was immersed. <clears throat> so what did we find comparing 17 cases? Just to give you the, the taste of the method, particularly, this is particularly important for the Polish case, which is of, of great interest uh, to us. So, Using a specific method, which I will not be um, describing here, we managed to reduce those 17 cases into five patterns. In those five patterns, there are two groups. There are fractured memory regimes and non-fractured memory regimes. To give you the taste of it, if you look, I will put aside Ukraine, very complicated case. The method told us that nothing in Ukraine is similar to any other country <laughs> in the sum. So in the, the method, which is kind of a computer-driven search for uh, certain patterns, produced Ukraine as a separate uh, case, just a t type in one of one country. But then the computer was more helpful with, with other um, uh, reductions and there was the pattern number two strong ideological polarization and or ethnicization of politics. The, the most clear is uh, just to give you again a sense how it works in Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia where you have relatively large uh, uh, minorities, Russian minorities uh, particularly in, in uh, it was most prominent in Latvia and well, we had a discussion about those cases uh, some time ago. I, I am doing it very lightly. I know the criticism of this particular uh, set. But in, if you have a strong ethnic polarization, you do expect different cultures emerging, particularly different cultures of memory over important events. And this is exactly what happened. The, the way the... 2000, uh, in 2011, uh, uh, 20 years after the breakup of the Soviet Union, it was all celebrated, was completely different, almost completely different, as if it were different events for the Russian minorities and for the titular majorities. So that's kind of structurally predetermined almost. It is, it is something that one would expect. But the third case, when you look at it in a comparative way, is uh, unexpected. Certainly, I, I didn't expect that. And this is what, in the political scientific lingo, can be called negotiated extrication from communists, right? Through negotiation. 
Um, and this is Poland, Hungary, and Slovenia. So those are the only three cases that in which you had substantial uh, negotiations, of course, most famously, most prominently um, in, in Poland. And after this uh, happens, you end up with a very interesting mechanism. So you have reform-oriented communist parties by, by the standard of the region. You have relative liberalization uh, in those countries. You know, more liberalized versus more hard hardline type of communism or state socialism, a standard tool in, 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 in thinking about the region then. You have strong oppositional movements. You have negotiated transitions via pacting. Pacts become the object of contention. Now, when, as, when we noted that, we started paying attention to what's happening in post-pact situations around the world, and it is a pattern everywhere. Think about South Africa. Mandela has become uh, an object of very intense criticism for uh, negotiating. So it seems that this is kind of almost inevitable, right? That there will be those on the side of the challengers to the incumbent regime who will be not, for one reason or another, included in the actual negotiation. And invariably, when you look across the world, they will attack that deal as rotten, stolen, corrupt, unfinished, and so on. Um, and this is the, the story which will be, obviously, a, an important part of, of, of our deliberations. But this clearly happened, and the actors, the mnemonic warriors in this case, Law and Justice in Poland, Fidesz in Hungary, and Slovenian Democratic Party in uh, Slovenia. <clears throat> Very quickly, non-fractured memory regimes. It means you, know, that you can have a different outcome, right? Thinking about how to uh, build the memory uh, of the fall of communism. And non-fractured memory regimes come in two uh, types. One is pattern of deliberate abnegation. Uh, something, in a way, you might have predicted, although before we did this study we didn't think about it much, that in um, uh, the former Yugoslavia outside of uh, Slovenia, people basically were saying, well, it happened elsewhere. It is not, 89 is not something that touches us directly. The only considerably important actors who participated or try to organize some celebrations in those countries were uh, external foundations, mostly German foundations. Uh, but the, the main slogan was, it was not, not about us. And this is something that doesn't belong to our history in a way. <clears throat> the second pattern, depolitization. Um, uh, it is very interesting because it, this uh, strategy of depolitization in Germany, Bulgaria, and the Czech Republic was Completely different. Uh, I, I have no time uh, to talk about it. But basically, if you think about Germany, or Katarzyna already mentioned that is an important case, uh, you, you have uh, an enormously well-developed mnemonic machine, if you can call it this way, to deal with the memory of the Holocaust and World War II. And that memory is employed to deal with the memory of communists and the fall of communists. So in a very effective way, this is all uh, organized and there are no serious defections, either institutionally or uh, culturally. As I described already the Czech case, um, in Bulgaria you have the highest level of nostalgia, measure, any way you will measure it, uh, for communism and there was kind of a reluctance and that, that uh, that's not kind of, there's not much to celebrate or not celebrate, kind of went without a major kind of symbolic splash, as say it happened in Hungary or in Poland. <clears throat> or Romania. Romania was, was very uh, intense, struggle was very intense. Very big difference between Bulgaria and Romania. So, 17 countries studied, um, five patterns. There's no one way uh, to construct the memory of the fall of communism. It is kind of a basic, simple thought, but it's worth remembering. Even if this memory is divisive, fractured memory regime, there is no one path to this outcome. Right? And here's this, uh, I'm repeating this thought about the surprise. Extrication from reform state socialism via negotiation was expected to engender moderation 
also in the politics of memory, it didn't. It produced fracturing, and fracturing was manufactured in a sense, I mean, in the neutral, I'm using the word manufactured, but it didn't happen because of some um, divine intervention or natural forces, but someone uh, created this situation. Uh, in that sense, it was uh, uh, manufactured in the conditions which might be called, described as the curse of negotiated transition. And here's the question, right? And in, in again, I, so something that I, I wish I would have more time to discuss. If you look at various factors and you study the relationship between uh, culture and society and politics, you talk about agency and structure, about something that is somehow predetermined, for example, by the existence of uh, uh, ethnic split or some possibly some uh, class split or, or, or s very specific set of institutions in a given place and so on. So this is something the actors cannot choose. They have to act within those pre-given constraints. So is it the case that this curse of negotiated transition is something that you cannot escape from? That's the biggest question. Um, and then you get to the point that social science becomes kind of helpless and it becomes, I believe, uh, an ethical uh, issue uh, as much as it is an, an, issue, an intellectual issue. Can they decide not to fight over this issue or any other issue for the sake of uh, uh, creating uh, a cultural peace, if we can call it like that? And in a moment, I will get to a try level of some argument why this kind of cultural piece, in this case, mnemonic piece, may be useful. So, those three areas to consider. Again, what, what I'm doing now is I'm thinking through, and this is not a finished thing, it is something I'm still working on, the relationship between the type of activity called uh, politica historicna, or historical policy, which is very activist-oriented in politics, and another type of activity which is a scholarly debate on the significance of, say, political actors in creating historical memory. So it is a scholarly debate on the creation of the of, on politics of history. So politics of history versus historical policy. That's unfortunately how the actually the existence of this language attracted me to, to this question because they're so close to each other, right? And they have something in common, namely that you're trying to figure out what is the role of an actor, of an activist in all of this. So um, where I, where am I with all of this now? I, those three areas attracted my attention. The spontaneous resilience of cultural codes, the increasing significance of scale, and the question of what is more important, regime or state? Let me take you through this very quickly, and this is just the, the final part of, of the presentation. So when you think about collective memory uh, as culture, and coming from anthropology, I, I cannot not to think uh, this way, um, you have to try to f define this thing called uh, national culture. A very tricky, very complex thing. The, the best way to stay away from a lot of emotional, ethical debates is to say the following thing. That national culture is a historically evolved set of discourses within each social space, sufficiently isolated from other such spaces for a period of time, such a, such a set will acquire specific features, a different set of symbolic markers. There's an incredible power in the continuation of those markers. It is not easy to break out of the pattern. This is a very much uh, path-dependent <coughs> another term that historically oriented social scientists uh, like to use, path dependence. So to just to give you the sense very quickly, and this is really almost silly the way I will illustrate this, but I, the, the contrasts are powerful enough. 
I think that even if we engage in a more sophisticated discussion of all of this, we will more or less end up in the same room, the same place. You think about Poland, I mean, this is again, this says, this says something about me, uh, you know, what, how am I going to illustrate Polish path, uh, national culture, into images? Well, I, I, for some reason, Rayfan came to, to my mind. This is the moment of, for those of you who do not know Mateko's painting, this is the moment uh, where the uh, <coughs> National Assembly the same, the, decides that the first partition of Poland is justified. Um, and one of the members of the Assembly, whose name was Tadeusz Rejtan, throws himself against the door and says, you will not get out of here, this is uh, something, this is treason. This is um, something that needs to be stopped. Uh, this heroic uh, uh, set of images that Mateko painted in, in the, uh, the 19th century is uh, incredibly powerful. This is, I remember very well how I was becoming a Pole, I suppose, sitting on my grandfather's lap and going through the album and absorbing those images one after another. This is how you, uh, it is how you acquire your, your cultural cult, right? Another one is uh, uh, the uh, Black Madonna of Częstochowa. And those of you who do not know that, that this is not in the original painting, but this is the second image superimposed on the first one. Uh, this is an equally important icon of Polish culture. I, I, I keep repeating this thing. Some of you heard me saying this, but I, I don't have a better way of saying that. I am not a Catholic, right? But if I do not know who that is and what role this image, this persona, cultural persona, plays in Polish culture, I am so much less a Pope, right? And I do not know this, 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 there are maybe a hundred of them. If I do not know anything about the whole hundred, I'm not a Pope. Right? Complete. So somewhere there, there's a, there's a minimum set, but certainly this image, that story, that narrative belongs somewhere in the center of, of the whole uh, complex called national culture. You can refer to this, you can relate to this in many different ways, right? So, but not knowing that, not being able to decode that painting, puts you outside of the national community. Um, if you take the, again, it's a very individual take. If you take the Hungarian uh, imagery, and particularly the way it was analyzed in our book, you, you get the 1956 as an absolutely dominant uh, event. Um, you get the, the flag, the famous symbol of the 1956 revolution where the Soviet symbols were cut out, and that flag with the hole in the center is repeated over and over again in many different contexts. And then you get the Trianon Hungary, the, the great Hungary. The myth of Trianon is, is very much driving a lot of thinking of mnemonic warriors in, in today's Hungary. And then final picture, uh, again, I, I, I dare to do that only because my great-grandfather was Czech, is that if you take the Czech culture, I can, I'm not saying that good soldier's fake is the only thing you should know about the, the Czech culture, right? But this with the Black Madonna of Częstochowa, if you do not know the story, and if you don't know what it is and what it stands for, you do not belong to the Czech national community in the sense, right? You are so much less of a Czech if you do not know uh, how to interpret, even in your own actions, in your own behavior, uh, uh, this, this particular story, this particular narrative. Um, it is a very different, I mean, uh, this carnivalesque uh, character of what happened in, 19, in 2009 has something to do with this somewhat more distant, more relaxed possibility of relating to your own past, which in Poland is almost unthinkable. Um, so, observation number one, national cultures, as cultural codes, are resilient. All of this survived communism. I mean, we can discuss it, we can have a lot of symposia on how uh, uh, it was transformed, how it was sometimes neglected, misinterpreted, but it basically all survived. And it was 
survived not necessarily because of state's efforts. Actually, the state's efforts were certainly in the Polish case very much directed through m m quite a long period of time against the memory built on those images. So the societies have this enormous mnemonic memory resilience without the help of the state. Significance of scale. Though, uh, over the last few years I've been participating in quite a few events and conferences reviewing all kinds of materials on what is being written about uh, uh, this topic, the politics of history. This is absolutely clear to me that the, the problematic of scale is coming to the fore, becomes one of the most important issues. Why? Although the national is clearly privileged, the national level memory, nation state memory, is clearly privileged. You have two extremely powerful processes that are happening and are actually, it seems, uh, accelerating. Transnationalization of memory, and the example is the building of European memory or trans European memory with a lot of problems and debates, for example, the Auschwitz versus the Gulag, the East versus West, and all this. So there's a problem of coordination. It is all changing. There are a lot of studies showing how this memory, European memory has been evolving since 1945. But nonetheless, it is happening. And it is absorbing a lot of energy and a lot of increasing numbers of people, if they are involved in memory politics at all, are involved also at this level. On the other end of the scale, you have tremendous explosion of subnational activity in regions and localities, in civil society in general, people just are taking this, those matters into their own hands. And you have recently also the conference on social movements and memory. Just to give you one example from a recent conference where I was, this is about Vienna. This is about the way uh, the numbers of monuments that were erected in, in uh, Vienna uh, in order to celebrate uh, anti-Nazi uh, uh, events, heroes, activists, everything related to the resistance to Nazism. So if you go to about this moment, look, it, the first peak is 80, uh, around 89. And then eventually as Austria begins to think and act more as an uh, actor that wants to be involved, included in, in European structures, the number of celebrations goes up. But what is extremely telling is that this is not organized by the Austrian government. This is all organized by either local government, the Viennese uh, municipality, or particularly civil society organizations. This is not the state that is doing it. So what, what you get is something like that, right? That the trains of transnationalization and regionalization and decentralization have left the station. This is happening on a large scale. The state-centered historical policy is bound to be increasingly contested. And the final uh, thought, most important. <clears throat> uh, you are engaged in the construction of historical policy. You are trying to create a certain type of collective memory. What for? Why are you doing this? I mentioned at the beginning those kind of big four objectives, where one of them is to legitimize something. But legitimize what? Right? And, and as I started thinking about it this way, I realized, well, the difference is between those two groups, activists versus scholars, by and large, is that they are thinking about different objects to legitimize. The provenance of historical policy worry about the state. They are consider, considering the state, particularly they want a strong state. The, the considerations of the political regime are almost non-existent or, or are rare. The direction of the bias, if you want to put it in those terms, is the strong state. Most, I would pose it to you, social scientists worry, at least equally, but I would say more than about the state, they worry about the political regime. And the direction of the bias is liberal democracy. To 
celebrate something, to commemorate something, for what? For the strong state or for a specific political regime or political system? That is the question. <clears throat> so centralized, if you push this line of thinking a little bit more, centralized strong historical policy may exacerbate mnemonic wars, undermine moderation, which we know since Aristotle is the major virtue of democracy, and weaken it. I'm jumping now from description and analysis to a more kind of ethically laden set of conclusions. But sometimes one has to do that. <clears throat> um, so to kind of organize all of this in, in one uh, table, if you look at the dominant logic of inquiry, if you look at the scholarly field, you have basically observation of debates between various visions. Whereas when you look at the political field, you have the propagation of the vision. So you start with a different place. But more importantly, you think about the privileged type of mnemonic actor. You have pluralist versus a warrior. If you have the privileged memory vision, privileged, it means that there are some um, ethical uh, normative decisions. This is not neutral anymore. This is something that Max Weber warned us not to do, but I guess we under the pressure of what's going on, uh, this, this division begins to shrink. Um, so you have pillarized versus fractured. And finally, the chief political object of interest is regime, as I argued a moment ago, versus um, the, the state. And you know, this comparative perspective, yes, obviously this is how we try to do our work. There's no sign, much of it at least, um, on the other side of it, and transnationalization, as I argued, and subnational level here is increasingly considered, whereas in among the proponents of historical policy, it is very rarely considered. But well, my argument is that this is something that works against the agenda. So finally, conclusion. I kind of hesitated writing this a little bit, but I kind of pushed it uh, a little bit. Um, more um, four conclusions about an attempt to create strong centralized cultural historical policy. Strong. I suspect that the discussion about the weak version would be more nuanced and more complicated. Number one, it is unnecessary. National cultures are resilient though evolving. There's no clear evidence that without the participation of the state something horrible will happen to the field of national memory. Two, clashing with the dominant trends, because there is an intensification of both transnational and subnational cultural mobilizations. Three, something I didn't talk about, but it is increasingly obvious, and politically isolating. The focus on the state and not the regime, what, again, what is the goal of all those activities, focus on the state and not the regime is out of sync with the dominant political culture of reference in international relations. You can hear all those voices coming from the outside world that are very critical of, of, of uh, the attempts to create such a policy. <clears throat> and final point number four, detrimental for democracy. Uh, because warriors and fractured memory cultures are simply not good for democracy. Uh, and this is the final point. Thank you very much.